Happy politics, and welcome to the only podcast that's more exciting than seeing Starbuck turn up on The Mandalorian. I'm McLean Kay, <laughs> the editor-in-chief of The Orca, and I'm joined in a socially distant manner by... Uh, it's Jordan Bateman, uh, ICBA, Independent Contractors Business Association, VP Comms, and Baby Yoda Stan. <laughs> We're all Baby Yoda Stans. It's like, well, that show's been fantastic, I just gotta say. Every episode, outstanding. Um, Boba Fett, uh, it's all happening. It's yeah, crazy. I did not care for the spiders, the, uh, but oh, everything no. else has been great. My poor it's nightmare fuel stuff. My poor 10-year-old was freaking out about the spiders. That was not great. <laughs> My yes. son started watching the rewatching first season, and um, we were going to let him start watching season two. And then we got to the Alien Spider episode and thought, yeah, no, um, no, that's good. He's also, fine. Um, I can... Baby Yoda eating that family's babies. I don't love that. <laughs> this was, uh, believe it or not, this was not on the format sheet for this week's episode. Here. <laughs> this is off the cuff. That's let's, the hottest of hot stoves. Let's talk about Jordan, another let's... man who will never remove his mask. John Horgan. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> let's talk about another uh, another man who uh, who wears no mask. Vaughn Palmer wrote a piece in, I guess, this morning's Vancouver Sun mm -hmm. uh, talking about uh, well, the last provincial election campaign and what went wrong for the BC Liberals. And uh, he quoted two very newsworthy opinion pieces that were published on Friday and Saturday, respectively. Uh, Saturday was Jane Thornthwaite, the defeated uh, North Shore BC Liberal MLA. And uh, the Friday piece you referenced was published on the Orca by Gavin Dew, the founder for, for uh, the Forum for Millennium Leader Millennial Leadership. Uh, first day with my new tongue. And uh, yeah, well, it's they both kind of made the same point, although Gavin's piece was a little more um, analytical and less personal, shall we say. <laughs> I have so many thoughts. Oh, look at you getting phone calls. It's Gavin saying, thank you for the plug. Um, first of all, thank you, Vaughn, for giving us uh, something to talk about today on Hot Stove, because uh, other than COVID numbers, really not a lot going on in BC politics at the moment. Um, I don't know. Would you want to talk about Gavin's piece first before it allow me to warm up into a rant about Jane Thornthwaite? Sure. Yeah. I mean, if you haven't read uh, Gavin's piece, I highly encourage you to do so. Gavin Gavin uh, kind of looks like a bit of a prophet in that he wrote a piece a few months back uh, talking about how, uh, well, first of all, that the myth that the young people don't vote is increasingly just that, a myth. And that um, increasingly people from various communities in BC, and he means specifically, you know, visible minorities and, uh, and young people, millennials, expect to see themselves reflected in uh, candidates uh, for the major parties, but also candidates that have a real realistic shot of winning. Um, it's no longer good enough to, I think the way he put it is, you know, to put a few visible minority candidates up in the writings, they have no shot of winning to reenact the charge of the light brigade. Look it up. It's a yes. good reference. And um, he's right. Uh, because as uh, he, I mean, he and many others have pointed out the, the field of candidates that BC liberals were able to put together, admittedly on very short notice, uh, what did not reflect the the modern British Columbia and um, and the returning MLAs perhaps even less so. Uh, so I mean, Gavin crunched the numbers and showed what the candidates looked like, or what the voters increasingly uh, look like in various communities, and uh, well, he ended up with the same conclusion that a lot of people have, which is that the BC Liberal Party needs to look hard and long at uh, its next slate of candidates in probably four years. Yeah, and I, I agree with all of that. I, I would. You know, if Gavin and I were having a beer, and Gavin's a friend of ours and we love him, um, if we were having a, a socially distant beer, I might grind him a little bit on um, taking too much out of this caucus of 28 uh, as far as the statistical representation of where the party mm. was at. There were a lot of ridings uh, that um, most people would consider winnable in virtually every election cycle that the BC Liberals lost. Essentially, almost every coin flip riding the BC Liberals lost. But the NDP were riding a 15-point wave. Um, you know, you, you ride a 15 point wave and then Langley East goes uh, NDP by three or four points. No one would consider that a safe NDP riding going forward. However, all that to be said, the bottom line here is, is very, uh, very clear. Um, Andrew Wilkinson and his team did not do enough to go out and recruit um, quality candidates, uh, did not recruit a broad cross section of what British Columbia looks like today, as you say. Um, they have not, the Beast Liberals have not had an, uh, an openly LGBTQ MLA since Lauren Maincourt in 2008. That's right. That's a bit shocking, like 12 years. Uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, there have been candidates who have run, but again, are they yeah. running in ridings that they have a legitimate shot to win? Um, it's an, an important question. 
Um, the under 40s uh, is, is a big problem. Only one person under 40 in the entire BC Liberal Caucus. That's roughly the same as last time, so that hasn't improved. But, you know, part of me is like, this is what happens in political parties at the end of, um, at the, end of the power cycle, right? You know, yeah. if you're an MLA, if, you know, 2001 they elect 77 MLAs, and then they get reelected in 05, 09, 13, and very close to 17. Guess what? Incumbents don't like leaving. Like, you know, incumbents hang around. They become cabinet ministers. They like the power. You know, they, they enjoy um, the perks. They, they have safe ridings. It's their job. It's their livelihood. They invest so much of their heart and soul into what they're doing. Um, you know, take, take Rich Coleman, for example, in Langley East. You know, he was an MLA there from 96 till last week. And that's 24 years. Well, there's a whole generation, yeah. two generations of political folks uh, in, in Langley East who didn't get to run because Rich was a very good local candidate, organized, uh, always got greenlit, and off he went. Mike DeYoung's riding. I think he was elected in 93. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the big failures of Michael Lee's leadership campaign was when Mike DeYoung was grind, like attacking him in the debate for having a, a nomination hand, you know, given to him, having him handpicked by um, Christy Clark. And Michael Lee didn't turn around and say, hey, DeYoung, anytime you want to put your nomination on the line at a nomination meeting, give me a call because you haven't done it since 1993. So, like, this is the problem with parties with power. And, you know, if the NDP were in power for, God help us, 10, 12, 16 years, they, all of their MLAs would be old. Like, it just, it's kind of one of those things that happen um, in a life cycle. Now, you have a bunch of people who have been, a bunch of writings that, generally lean BC Liberal, that in a mm -hmm. non-15 point uh, election um, would be, would revert back to BC Liberal ridings. The Langley's, the Chilliwack's, the Abbotsford's, um, I'd argue even one of the Maple Ridges, uh, maybe one of the Surrey's, like those are winnable ridings. Now the key is whoever the next leader is, you've got to go out, you've got to find great candidates who can form the, the core of your team going forward. So they should be young, they should be ethnically diverse, um, they should be smart as whips, and you know, and plug them into there. And if that means, if that means skipping nomination means and disappointing, I'm kind of okay with that. The, the yeah. having the right person is better in my mind than having the, the popular person. Yeah, well, especially if that if that person ends up being, uh, you know, you know, at best a non-entity, but at worst an embarrassment down the road. Yeah. Uh, I think that, um, I, like you, I agreed with with Gavin's piece, uh, and that it's been interesting seeing these series that we've been running on the Orca about, you know, what the BC Liberal Party needs to do from here. But what is sort of striking me reading it from uh, a bunch of different perspectives is that I, we know the BC Liberal Party is, is going to undertake a, a review of what happened in the campaign. And what it seems to me is while there are some identifiable issues and problems, there's no, you know, one thing you can point to and say that it was that. It, it was a, uh, it was a bit of a perfect storm in some respects. There was the issues that we just discussed that Gavin, uh, I, I thought described brilliantly. But there was also the pandemic. Uh, there was also yes, some some failures in the campaign itself. There was some uh, mistakes that uh, came in the and out of the leader's office. But it was um. It was a series of things, a collection of things that's put the party where it is now. It's not that there's a single button they can push that, well, that's fixed. We'll, yeah. you know, we'll, be, we'll be back in four years. Yeah. Look, the BC Liberals, I feel like we're drawing dead going into this election. Like the, there was, you know, the, the NDP had everything stacked in their favor because they could. And they were, yeah. uh, bluntly, immoral enough to capitalize on a pandemic. Uh, that just ain't, that just wasn't going to be Andrew Wilkinson. And, you know, he'll go, he'll be go down in history as, you know, a wildly defeated BC Liberal leader. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure, like, the, the problem with Gavin's piece is a little bit like, okay, so we pl let's plug in 25 bright shining stars into, you know, 15 winnable ridings and 10 long shots. None of them are going to win. Like, it just no. wasn't that kind of election, right? Like, you just yeah. can't, you can't turn the corner on that, um, on COVID. So... But there's a vaccine coming. Um, certainly, mm -hmm. I think apparently day by day the shine comes off BC's, you know, quote unquote world leading response uh, to COVID. Um, even Dr. Bonnie's being forced to write op eds to defend kind of weird things like, you know, I don't have a mask mandate, but I actually mandate masks at all workplaces. But I don't have a mask mandate. But you know, we want like just just do it. Just pull the trigger and do it. Like 
come on. Yeah. Just mandate the mass in Vancouver Coastal and Fraser Health. Who cares? Like, just do it. But it's this weird thing. So, you know, all, I guess what I'm trying to say is when it comes to COVID, the sweater is kind of unraveling a little bit. Yeah. Um, it's not looking good. Um, can I rant just briefly about the COVID press conference yesterday? You can, you can rant just longly if you like. <sighs> McLean, I've watched... <laughs> I know there's been what? What were we in month seven? So they've probably been doing. Kind of stuff. So we've probably had a hundred. Oh God, eight months these. now, I think. So let's say we've had 120 of these press conferences. We've probably had more. I've watched 30, 40 of them. So you know, yeah, a third. Yesterday's was featured the single stupidest question from a member of the press since this whole thing started. And I've had, I've heard lots of stupid questions from the press. And you know how they say there's no such thing as a stupid question? This was a stupid question. <laughs> Basically, the question went like this. I was talking to a noon hour supervisor at a school in Surrey, and she was talking to a grade six girl who was running around without a mask, and she had been tested positive for COVID seven days ago, and she wouldn't put on a mask because this grade six student said, you know, we're, I don't have to put on a mask, because Fraser Health told me I don't have to put on a mask, so I'm not gonna put on a mask, and I'm gonna, you know, and the, student, is, the supervisor is very concerned about how she's infecting the school. What? You're wasting Dr. Bonnie's time with what a grade six girl said on the playground and you don't even have the grade six girl source. You have the noon hour supervisor who claims this is what the grade six girl told them. Do you understand? Like grade sixes, they lie. They, they, they exaggerate. <laughs> they get things wrong. They get yeah, things wrong. You're wasting Dr. Bonnie's question. time with this question. I couldn't believe it. I, honestly, Dr. Bonnie, like, to her credit, didn't just throw down her mic and walk off, right? Like, she's like, you know, very big. Well, you know, I, it's very difficult to comment on hearsay and, you know, in classic Dr. <laughs> Bonnie. <clears throat> if I was Adrian Dix, I might have stepped in at that point and been like, uh, Doctor, uh, may I say a few words? Guys, we're doing these media <laughs> briefings for a reason. We want good questions that make sense in order to get the message out to British Columbians. That is not the kind of question that we expect from you. Grill us, make it tough on us, you know, ask us tough questions. That is ridiculous. Um, but, Anyways, I, I just, it drives me crazy. Like this, you get two questions, sorry, one and a follow-up, and that's yeah. what you're wasting it on? Don't hit the button then. Don't say that you have a question. If your question is, a grade six girl on an unnamed school yeah. playground in an unnamed place in Syria, and talked to an unnamed supervisor, and she said, come on. There is, there is a number, there's a lot of um, politics in, uh, you know, who gets to ask the questions. And uh, I, I know that there is a lot of pressure in some newsrooms for their reporters to be among those who get the questions because there are, you know, the, the regulars every day. And so if you are not in that regular rotation, um, it, it is incumbent on you to press one, as you say, right away and get in the queue and try and, and get up there for a question, even if you rightly suspect they don't really have a particularly great question. There's not – because they're doing these briefings three times a week, hey, how many times have we heard some of these same questions? I mean it's it's the same answer over and over and over again. And I guess they feel you know it, it needs to be refreshed every few days. But yeah. I, I don't know. I'm Like you, I'm getting less and less out of the Qs and As. And I, I mean you can almost just now wait for the news release to be yeah. to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Dr. Bonnie, why won't you mandate masks in the Lower Mainland? Yeah. Dr. How many Bonnie times answers? have we had that question? Follow up. Asked? Dr. Bonnie, why won't you mandate masks? <laughs> like, <laughs> no, those aren't questions. Like, come on, guys. Like, you're the best of the best reporters in the province. You have access to the one person that we would all like to have 20 minutes of the time of. Um, you know, and you're asking about grade six girls. Like, I don't know. It just... Yeah. Anyway, so that was that was that. Right back to Gavin, who's a lovely, a lovely human being. Yes. Um, no, and we, we, uh, and we, uh, and we got a slightly. I mean, COVID is never off topic, but we started talking about Gavin. Uh, you wanted to talk about Jane Thornthwaite's piece as well on the weekend. Um, I prefaced it by saying Gavin's was a little more, you know, high level and analytical, and uh, a prescription as well. Jane's was um, more direct, more personal, more, well, that's, that, I think that's the word there, isn't it? It's personal. Okay. Jane Thornton. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Brace yourself. <laughs> the story career of Jane Thornton. Wait. Jane, I've met her many times in person. Incredibly mm -hmm. nice person. Lovely person. You know, funny um, when she's not belittling women on roasts. 
Um, listen, I got, after an election, what, what's the old saying? Uh, you know, author ha or uh, victory has a thousand authors and defeat yes. is an orphan. Defeat is, yes. When def what we're seeing now is this orphan defeat and everyone involved in the campaign trying to pass it off to someone else. No, no, you have custody. No, you have custody. No, you have custody. No, you foster this thing. And eventually it'll <laughs> end up on Andrew Wilkinson and, and a lot of the blame should be on him. So, Jane, Jane Thornthwaite has a long and storied career in BC Liberal Caucus. Um, a, a couple leaders ago, she... Um, had an incident uh, where she was arrested for a DUI or was charged or whatever, caucus stood by her. Now caucus was kind of painted into a corner because the leader at the time had also been arrested for a DUI in Maui, but what else? Uh, yeah. There wasn't a lot of freedom there to wriggle around. But caucus rallied around her. I think she had to resign from cabinet maybe at the time. I can't remember if that she was um, or not, but. That I don't know. It was, it, it was embarrassing. And to her credit, mm -hmm. she worked hard to restore herself within the party. Like she worked with folks, she got reelected. Uh, the people of uh, North Vancouver, whatever her riding is, Seymour, um, mm -hmm. said, okay, no, we forgive you. Great, clean slate. Fast forward to the, what's the, uh, what's the Christian magazine, Light Magazine issue. So we fast forward. Light Magazine happens. Um, and Todd Stone and Jane Thornthwaite jump out before they talk to their caucus or talk to their leader or talk to the people who put the ad in and shred the 20 or so MLAs who put an ad in a Christian publication. A Christian publication that had an op-ed on conversion therapy, which is, I can't, on behalf of Christians everywhere, I apologize to the world for the idiocy of people who believe that conversion therapy is a thing. It's just, it's ridiculous and, you know, they'll be held to account in this life and the next one for that kind yes. of Yes. Gay, gay is one of the many things you cannot pray away. It's ridiculous. Anyways, so, but they jump out before talking to the team. Look, what was the ad? The ad wasn't, we endorse conversion therapy, signed by your PC Liberal Caucus. No, it was, yeah. happy Easter, Christians. And then little, the little, like, that was it. Just like you advertise in, um, you know, a Muslim publication, you know, for Ramadan, just like you would wish people uh, happy Diwali in, in, in a Punjabi publication. Like these, it's just what you do. And you're not endorsing the content. And they could have come out and said, look, you know what? We recognize it. Like we were really uncomfortable with that piece, you know, but reporters, you know, you know what it's like. Rob Shaw, for example, you were pissed off when there was a published uh, op-ed on, you know, mm. that was sort of, you consider racist. Um, by your bosses, but we didn't quit advertising the Vancouver side. You didn't quit writing for the Vancouver. Like you could have really, like, kind of explained it. We're trying to wish Christians a happy Easter. There's a limited supply of Christian newspapers out there. This was the one we put an ad in, and, and we'll review some, make sure that you know we're not supporting this kind of stuff in the future. Okay, no, but she jumps out and throws her colleagues under the bus and apologizes, and like before they can even come out with sort of a plan. So, I, so she wears thin with a big chunk of her caucus. Then the Lori stuff happens. And the, the convenient thing that Jane Thornthwaite doesn't talk about in her piece, shredding the leader for having a double standard between her and Lori is, he did have a double standard. And the double standard actually favored you, Jane, because he fucking kicked Lori Thronis out of the party, out of caucus, and sacrificed a seat in Chilliwack because he found Lori's views so abhorrent. You got to stay on the ballot in North Vancouver Seymour and take your case to the people and they voted your ass out. So tell me how you think Lori Thronis got off easy compared to you. Now, is Andrew hypocritical on this issue? In a way, yes. He, you know, kind of in, in private, it sounds like he did not think the roast stuff was that big a deal because it was a roast and logic kicked in and he's like, well, it's a roast, yeah. you know, you, you roast people and you know, turn on Comedy Central and watch any roast and tell me you don't cringe every yeah. time you hear anything out of their mouth. He, he thought the context trumped the content. Totally. And it turned out he was wrong about that. He was wrong. But, you know, and then he threw her under the bus again out in public. But like, okay, so you can criticize him for that. And I got no problem with that. Like the private and the public man, um, the Mandalorian mask. That, that's fine. But you can't, like, you can't claim that somehow Lori got a better deal than you he was kicked out of caucus. He was kicked off the ballot, out of the team. And, you know, lot, the Liberals sacrificed that seat. So I, I just, 
like it just seemed like such ass covering this piece. And you know, there's been a couple like this. Todd Stone came out with one, which is you know mm -hmm. just a naked foundation for a leadership run. Um, I, I'm much more interested in what the people who actually are going to rebuild the party have to say, like Gavin Dew, than I am with what uh, yesterday's folks like Jane Thornthwaite have to say. Well, I mean, I can't argue. It's uh, one does have to wonder what what she what what she wanted to accomplish by writing this. It's uh, other than you know perhaps just you know feeling that she absolutely had to get her side of the story out there, and uh, uh, she yeah. she did have some points. I will say in her defense, like you know, waiting forty eight hours to be told she made a fool of herself was was probably not the best move, and uh, that should have been handled much more rapidly and expeditiously. And yeah. because it created a vacuum of comments that it became worse. I mean, not that it was good in the first place, but, but that said, yeah, it just, it seemed like score settling and, um, eh, I, I don't know who it was designed to help other than, you know, making, I suspect, I hope Jane feels a little better after getting it out there, but yeah, uh, well, I, I, I'm sure it's cost her friends in the party. Um, opinion. Here's her quote. I was wrong and have only myself to blame for what I said, but I also want to show how the response and lack of leadership made the situation worse. I don't know about you, McLean, but in parenting, we teach the children, if you're adding the but, it's not really a heartfelt apology. That's true. That and look, is and true. let's not lose sight of the issue. <laughs> she went on a public forum. I mean, forget public mm -hmm. forum. Public or private, this is bullshit. She goes out there and says, oh, uh, young, attractive, uh, NDP MLA used her feminine wiles to confuse old Ralph Sultan and flirted her way to, I'm not sure what Ralph would provide, niceness? Like, Ralph is nice to everyone. He's nice to me and I never flirted with him. So I don't really get it. Like it just pisses me off because this is the kind of stuff, you know, we talk about how leadership races create divisions and parties and you have to kind of heal them all up. Um, is that Jane Thornthwaite calling you? And no, it's my buzzer. I'm it can kidding. wait. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, uh, Jane Thorn. so, we talk about how leadership races can often create uh, issues in the party, um, divisions in the party. So does stuff like this. And so you gotta be really careful when you're coming out. Like, save that for the post-mortem. Uh, save, you know, I, uh, airing this kind of dirty laundry in public. This was nothing except Jane Thornthwaite trying to repair Jane Thornthwaite's reputation after Jane Thornthwaite said things that got Jane Thornthwaite's ass kicked. That is the problem. and. You know, when we talk about Gavin's piece about the kind, new kind of candidate we need, it's not just an age and demographic thing. It's a sensitivity, it's an understanding that we can be fiscally conservative and still be socially liberal. Those are not, you know, that is the sweet spot for this party. Um, and it's saying, you know, and it's finding candidates who aren't like Jane. Uh, in the, I don't want to make Jane the, Jane's not a demon or the evil, great no. evil in the party, but we, you know, our party deserves better, British Columbia deserves better, and we must all do better. That's the uh, final line of Jane Thorpe's piece. Yeah, we did deserve better than this piece here, Jane. Uh, <laughs> we did say buckle up. Yeah, well, you mentioned uh, I'm always as a bad a segue. guy in these things. How come you're never the, uh, how come you never, uh, had, uh... <laughs> that's not true. I have been the bad guy on occasion. You, got the and you, you always remark on it when it does happen. Uh, much and like, much I, I like fear... my wife, McLean gets the phone calls and the tweets uh, saying, can you calm Jordan down a little bit? <laughs> that is, yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> well, this, one you mentioned... me, this one just drives me crazy. Like, it's, the well, one yeah, thing, kinda... and this, this is the Andrew Wilkinson failure. One of Andrew Wilkinson's great failures is he did not knit these guys together as a team. He that's did true. not get them to realize that the crest on the front was more important than the name on the back. And Ooh, that is expression. a major problem. I mean, I remember going to Victoria and working my way down the cattle stalls where all the MLAs are. And you'd stick your head in and you'd have, you know, three to seven minute conversations with each of them. Greg, Greg Kylo, shoe swap. You know, how's it going up there? What's the business like? Uh, you know, what's the tourism business like? Uh, you know, I work with ICBA, so, you know, construction, we've got a few companies that are popping up on there. So is there a building boom? What's happening up there? He would tell you. And then you go to the next stall. Michelle's still well. Hey, Michelle, how you feel? Like, you know, training for anything. And, you know, you should have the surgery. So you're feeling better. Just those personal touches. Yeah. And I'd get to the end of the stalls and, you know, Simon Gibson and all, you know, all these guys. And 
they'd be like, oh, we've never had anyone come down this far before. And the leader should be sticking his head in every single one of those stalls. You should have a very tight understanding of what those people want to accomplish when they're in office, how he can help uh, or she can help make their goals happen, and have some sort of relationship with each of them. And Andrew Wilkinson sat in his office at the end of the hall in the nice well, it's not nice. The opposition leader's office is a dump because <laughs> no one ever wants to fund it. But he sat there and he didn't work the stalls. And then he wonders why Jane and Todd jump out and try to save their own asses when things go wrong. He wonders why we get pieces like this after. He wonders why the team wasn't cohesive. Um, he wonders why young people didn't want to jump to run for the BC Liberals. You've got to actually create a culture that makes you feel like um, you have a chance. It's almost like NBA culture now, right? Like, the money no longer matters. It's, I wonder yeah. if I can win, I wonder if I can play with my friends. And that's what we're seeing in free agency in the NBA. Um, that's kind of the mindset the leader has to take. We're in this together. The disappointing thing is in 2013, 20, 2017, we saw a real rebound of that culture. It had fallen apart because of George Abbott and, and, and pulling knives on Gordon Campbell and you know, never really acclimatizing or uh, uh, giving Christy Clark a chance. 2013 rolls around, Michelle Stilwell and a few others really take it upon themselves like, hey, let's all go for a, a run every morning or a walk every morning. And, you know, and here you have this like Paralympian gold medalist leading you in her wheelchair like, on this thing. And you're like, holy crap, like I'm, I'm jogging with a gold medalist, right? You know, people losing weight, they, they were knit together, they were like starting to form that cohesive team. 2017 comes, it all falls apart. Christy resigns, Plekis stabs them in the back twice. Uh, and the rest is history. But at some point, you've got to get back to like, you've, you've got to find a way to rebuild that team's confidence and you know, convince people like Shirley Bond and Mike DeYoung that, hey, you can now pass the torch off to a younger generation. It, it's going to be okay. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned um, uh, one name in there a couple times. And speaking of pieces that ran in the last week, uh, Todd Stone. And I think you're quite right. It was kind of a, a why I'm about to run for leadership manifesto. And I think he hints at it at the piece, if I remember right. He has not yet decided. He's decided. Um, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Todd Stone, Stone is one name. Falcon. Stone, Ross, and Falcon are in. Is That's, yeah, that was kind of where I was going yeah. is that we have, there, I mean, there hasn't been any official, official announcements yet. So have our, it's uh this is all still kind of. Yeah. I, I don't think you'll see official announcements till the new year. Once the party sets up the yeah. rules, there's no point. Um, oh, exactly. Yeah. But you know, these guys, these, and the, there are three guys who we've just named, they're out there making phone calls, meeting with people, building teams, gauging support. Um, Els Ross and brought John Rustad down. The two of them uh, met a bunch of folks down here last week. Um, Kevin Falcon's calling around to virtually anyone who'd ever, who's ever masterminded a uh, leadership race win in the past. Um, you know, it's um, Todd Stone is, you know, Todd Stoning. Um, so you know, like these things are happening. I, I, I suspect there'll be a couple other candidates come out of the woodwork, I would think. There's still, yeah. there's still a little bit of buzz around Michael Lee that he might jump back in. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that one. I mean, we. Uh, I, I think he's considering it. I uh, I think the, there are tires being kicked, but whether he does it or not, I don't know. Yeah. I think that's a 50-50 shot, to be honest. Yeah, our friend George Affleck ruled himself out the other day. Yes, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I there's a couple Jody other Vance, names. I think Jody Vance scared him out of it. Like, George, <laughs> I missed you on the podcast. No, you yeah. cannot run again. It's over. We're not <laughs> scheduling a new guest every week again. No, George, we're not doing that. That's don't. right. That's right. You're stuck with. You're stuck there forever. Uh, episode seven thousand eight hundred twelve of this <laughs> No, and like, and you know, for George, like, talking talking about premier indie Bateman. Yes. Yeah, she, she could do it. Uh, George is the. Um, <laughs> George is too smart for politics. Like he's just such a he's such a brilliant <laughs> guy. Uh, you know, he manages to get his opinions out on Unspun in a way that aren't like me ranting. And no one ever calls upset about George Affleck, even though he's knifing them, uh, knifing bad ideas just as much as uh, I do. But he's got that uh, he's got that roguish charm about him. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say never, but it is rare. Yeah. Here's to you, <laughs> underscore. Tink. 
<laughs> Cheers to underscore. Uh, any other names you've heard that either uh, we've talked about a few others in the past? Yeah. We, I mean, it's worth pointing out that all the names we just mentioned are in fact men. Yes. Um. I. I. The. We. Uh, I've heard rumors about. Is it uh, Renee Merrifield? I've heard rumors, um, but nothing concrete. But maybe, but, maybe but that's it. Yeah. Just nothing concrete either. Yeah. Should I go to Kelowna? I'm not allowed to travel. So. Well, I feel pretty yeah. essential. Like rebuilding yeah, well, the fr- rebuilding a free enterprise coalition is probably seems like an essential work to me. Yeah, I mean, if it's not pretty essential, it's essentially pretty, yeah. and uh, it's. <laughs> Renee Merrifield doing. or I don't, other people, I don't... if you're watching this, reach out to us. We'd like to hear from you. I want to know uh, who is Renee Merrifield and why is she thinking about perhaps running for? Yeah, league? or, or anyone else who's thinking about running. I mean, this is this is the place to start plugging your, uh, you know, start planting some seeds. Yeah. It would be fun to say, you know, I heard from I don't know. A couple of Random weeks ago, person. remember a couple of weeks ago, I floated Emil Shuffle's name. He's out. Yes, yes, he's out. So. He's out. Okay. What are you gonna do? But that was that was us just having fun putting names out there in the in the in the ether. But uh, we'll see. There's, I mean, as you say, there's been nothing official. There probably won't be anything official until the new year. Yes. No, I, I can't imagine there will be. First of all, the party's got. The party should do the postmortem first, and then launch the leadership yeah. race. I, I'm curious who they get to do the postmortem. I, I would have some suggestions on that but no one seems to call and ask me who i think so um but, well they don't they already, i mean does the party need to hire an executive director first before they conduct a, a post-mortem is that i don't think so is that i mean I, no I who's I, i'm not sure who they've appointed in the interim is it i don't know i i don't know either there are people watching this who don't believe that we don't know but i don't know uh, is it rachel is she doing it hong i actually don't i, I uh don't have no idea all right, if you're not watching BC Liberal Headquarters, tell us who's running you. Who's in charge there? <laughs> Let us know. Who said the hell? We should probably know this. This is uh, <laughs> this, this podcast has just gone completely off the rails as we just now. It has. Well, I mean, there's now, only in two fairness, things in the... I have no idea who's running NDP headquarters either, so. I, I want to be an equal opportunity um, uh, ignorance. Isn't it Craig, Craig Keating? Isn't he still the par- party president? He's the president, but I mean, Barbo is still the president. That's true. Uh, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Nor a green yeah. HQ either. Uh, um, you want to talk about you know, the, Should we talk? Uh, can we talk about the politics of COVID? Let's talk about the politics of COVID. Uh, I was going to say that that's really the only topic right now that people are talking about. Okay, so is COVID. So, uh, as you know, as you may be aware, I'm not the world's <clears throat> biggest Justin Trudeau fan. <clears throat> I find his spending to be dangerous uh, pre-COVID. Um, I think he's compounded the issue now. Um, I find him to be um, much more flash than substance. But I'm going to give the devil his due on one thing. The guy's gone out and made sure that we are invested in every single vaccine that could possibly come to fruition here. I, I read somewhere that Canada is like has three times more per capita vaccines yeah. booked than any other civilized country. We have something like 10 different vaccine doses for every Canadian. And I, for it's one, fantastic. say, that is not enough. Let's go for 12. Let's go for 15. <laughs> as many as it takes to make sure that we get well, to the front to, of the line. You have to account for immigration. Yes. That's, no, it, you're right. The, the federal government has cast an admirably wide net when yeah. it comes to vaccination. And it's one thing that we can feel good about. When you mentioned Justin Trudeau and COVID politics, I thought for a second we were going to talk about the, <laughs> the New World Order trend on Twitter yesterday. <laughs> okay, so where for did this even come life. from? Where did it come from? Because it's too sweet. So where did it, like, where did this, I wake up and New World Order is trending. I'm like, oh, finally, a reason to watch wrestling again. Here we go. I, I thought maybe like Kevin Nash had died. That was oh. my first like, oh no. And maybe then you read it's about Justin Trudeau one. and you're thinking, oh no. Because <laughs> you know it's going to be dumb. And it yeah. didn't disappoint. It was dumb. Yeah. And then the evidence is like, everyone's using the build back better slogan. What? That's just a great alliteration. That's why they're using it. Yeah. Uh, uh, the New World Order, I feel confident that Justin Trudeau is too dumb uh, to uh, manage to architect a New World Order uh, onto Canadians. So, uh, Jen Gerson had a fantastic thread yesterday talking about how no, just that fact. That, I mean, it's dumb enough to think it about any prime minister, but yeah. I mean, for Justin Trudeau in particular, I mean, he, if he couldn't mastermind the Security Council seat, he can't mastermind the entire world. Yeah, yeah, the new <laughs> world order. But rest assured, 90s wrestling fans, like Sting in the rafters, McLean and I will keep our eye on this new world order, make sure they it's don't true. go too far. Although, in hindsight, Sting really let a lot go there before he actually stepped in. 
That's true. <laughs> you did kind of a, had a very laissez-faire attitude for a very well, long time. And, and for but, the non-wrestling uh, yeah. fans out there, uh, who you know, for anyone watching this who's not named Dave Texera, uh, Sting was a uh, Sting was a character in a, a wrestling promotion called WCW. There was a New World Order that came in and they took <laughs> over the promotion, and he would sit in the rafters in crow makeup, crow like superhero makeup, and glare at them. And then finally came down and uh, and did he defeat Hogan? I can't remember. He did. He did. He defeated Hogan. Oh, and I think Bret Hart uh, was the guest referee. He was. Yeah, he was the guest enforcer. And, uh, it's funny wrestling. You mentioned Dave. Uh, Dave Ca, who is a uh, not, well, not only a wrestling fan, but is a wrestling promoter yeah. and has fantastic stories about that. By the way, I highly encourage you to seek those out. Uh, every once in a while, I'll make an obscure wrestling reference on Twitter, and I'll, you'll get like the most surprising response from somebody who you, who clearly is a fan. I, I, yesterday, it was Mo Amir, the this is Van Color guy. Yeah was going on in depth about 90s WCW uh, happenings. Like, wow, I had no idea. Good well, for you. Van Van Color, the second best podcast in British Columbia behind Hot It's Silver. not as exciting as Starbucks showing up on The Mandalorian, but I mean, there's only room yeah. for one king. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, ex- you're exactly right. Dave, uh, by the way, Dave Texero, my favorite Dave story is they were doing a, um, his wrestling promotion was doing like a food fundraiser. And so they wrestled yeah. for 24 straight hours. And so at 3 a.m., He's like, uh, he's, he knew my longtime dream. I was a Langley Township counselor at the time. Uh, my longtime dream to be a guest referee. So I got to guest referee a match at something like 3 a.m. And That's so cool. uh, it was great. I even got to push a guy who was getting in my face. And that guy took a real bump for me. And uh, I've always appreciated Dave um, um, doing that. I always thought it would have been fun as a, like, get elected mayor somewhere and then go to the neighboring town and just start shredding them in a wrestling promotion. Like, you know, Absolutely. These... Didn't that happen in New Westminster? Didn't the mayor get involved in a match? I, I believe I'm so. sure I saw this. Th- those ECCW matches back in those, like in, in New Westminster, <laughs> were crazy. I once saw a guy get hit with a fluorescent light tube. I once saw a guy get rock oh. bottomed on the hood of a car out on Front Street or whatever that street is in, in New West. It, it was cra- it, crazy times, and I've obviously <laughs> grown out of it. I kind of, <laughs> I don't know. There, there are times like there are times where 20, 21, 22 year old Jordan would like to reappear and uh, and go watch a good uh, a good wrestling match, uh, you know. But now I'm old. Now I'm old. Yeah. Now I just rant about Jane Thornthwaite, and this is my life now. <laughs> I mean, this not only did this podcast had uh, start with a Battlestar Galactica reference, uh, mm. it, and it, it wrapped up with you praising Justin Trudeau and then us talking about 90s wrestling. This is probably the most unusual episode proves, of Hot Stove yet. This proves that not all of this has happened before. Not all of this will happen again. That's good. All right. Uh, I, I, aside from COVID and the uh, laundry list of BC Liberal uh, op-eds, uh, I don't have anything else this week. Uh, other than, I, I guess, you know what? We should mention that it does look like this, the House is going to come back to legislature um, probably for a week or two. God, God willing, no more than that in December. I have no no interest well, to sit and watch question period on December twentieth. Look who decided to leave his basement in Souk. Welcome back to the real <laughs> world, Premier. Nice of you to join us here in the pandemic that your social license helped worsen by calling in an immoral and unnecessary election. Uh, well, but I thank also, you for putting I, your job I ahead think, of all of everyone else's in the yeah. process. That's great. I think that his the reason he had given before about possibly not having a fall session and, uh, you know, no worries about the thousand dollar checks we promised all of you was that the reason he gave was there's no nice way to say this, but kind of dumb uh, in that um, he said it was, well, the new MLAs want to have their official swearing in ceremonies. Who cares? Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, when you're telling schools that they're going to have to ramp up distance learning, that, you know, I'm sorry, and, and this is no slight on any single one of the new MLAs who do deserve to have all the bells and whistles that comes with earning that office, but it's a pandemic. And, you know, if you have to do a, you know, a Zoom or a virtual signing in ceremony with the yeah. uh, lieutenant governor, that's really, is that the biggest deal? Is that the encumbrance? Um, and it just wasn't a good reason at all. Yeah. Um, eh. It looks as though that might be exactly what's happening. <laughs> yeah. Um, first of all, I appreciate that you and I did not devolve into the laziest uh, podcast trope, which is cabinet speculation. Um, oh, yes. I hate that. Cause there's just That's next week. No, just kidding. But um, you're right. Uh, this is not rocket science. Swear them in. They're going to be sworn in by, by Zoom anyways. Once it's yeah. post-pandemic, you can, I'm sure Janet Austin will be happy to show up for a photo op. Of course, but, yeah. But there's no reason. In fact, and, she, and it'll it'll look just as cool on their mantle. 
Exactly. In fact, she'll probably have them all at the government house and get a picture with each of them. And like, it's fine. Yeah. It'll all work out. But to hold up cash that you promised British Columbians. First exactly. Of all, I actually think this promise is going to backfire a little bit on him. And here's why. Everyone keeps saying it's $1,000. It's not. It's $500 it's, a person. Yeah. Um, so if you're not married, you're not getting your 1000 bucks. Um, and there are very strict uh, levels, right? So you, your household income, even though it's individual, your household income has to be less than $125,000 a year. Well, that is That's, a big chunk of the people of British Columbia. It's not all of them. And it's not a lot of people who, you know, if you're making, you know, you make 70, your wife makes 75, you're 145, it sounds like a lot of money, but you're not rich. You're not wealthy. No. You are decidedly no. middle class. That's, and, that's you and your partner are both, you know, supervisors at Starbucks is what it, that is. Or yeah. a manager at Starbucks. Exactly. Which is great, yeah. but you're not, you're not yeah. the upper class. Imagine being a teacher <laughs> You're not right the now. wealthy. Imagine being a teacher right now and you feel like you're putting your ass on the line every day health-wise by going into those schools and yeah. teaching to keep the economy going and to keep kids from, you know, losing yet another year of school. And then you happen to be married to a iron worker, you know, someone who's from Elmas Steel, you know, foreman. You know, and your household income is 175. Um, a lot of money. You are not eligible for the 500 dollars because it goes 120. It staggers from 125 to 175. A firefighter married to a cop. A lawyer married to well, lawyers are lawyers are a different breed, but you know what I mean. Um, so, like, I actually think this is going to be a little bit of a disappointment to a lot of folks. And yeah. I, for one, am here for it because you know what would have saved everyone money. A PST cut, but that's the story. It's for true. Day. Well, and you mentioned, you know, a lawyer married to a cop, uh, a, an unemployed person married to a premier's office staffer. Also, oh! not, also. Uh, all right. <laughs> Wrap it up. On that, on that, on that end. Uh, I used to be a premier's office staffer, and I would have qualified, just for the record. Right, nice. um, on that, to the, until next week, um, he's Jordan Bateman. I'm McLean Kay. Um, happy politics. Too sweet.